Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to our signpost series webinar this morning. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, this morning, we're going to uh, spend another hour or so teasing through another issue of sustainability and environmental uh, concern that we've been looking at for our last, actually, this is our 116th webinar this morning. My name is Andy Boland, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so. I'd like to acknowledge and thank our partners on this journey, Dairy Sustainability Ireland, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and the National Rural Network. This morning, our guest is from Glanbia, Ireland. Thomas Ryan is the Senior Sustainability Manager, and Thomas is going to talk to us about Glanbia, Ireland's Living Proof Sustainability Strategy. Thomas, good morning, and thank you for taking the time and effort to join us. Uh, good morning, Andy. Uh, it's great to be with you, yourself and Noel and, and your listeners. So thanks for having me. Noel, you're welcome as well. Noel, you're going to give us a hand with our Q&A and keep an eye on the, the questions as they're coming in. Noel Meehan is our ASAP manager and he's based in Athenry. Noel, thanks for joining us this morning. No problem, Andy. Thomas, um, it's, a, it's a big ask that we're probably asking you to, to, to talk to us about this morning, but Maybe you might begin by telling us a little bit about your own journey uh, to Glanbia and uh, your role within Glanbia before you begin the, talking to us about the strategy. Okay, okay. Well, look, thanks very much. I think um, when I graduated uh, from, from UCD, uh, I did an agricultural science degree in UCD. Uh, I joined the, the Kerry Group graduate program uh, and I spent the first number of years working in the area of sales and operations uh, with Kerry. Uh, it was an exciting time. It was during the acquisition of Golden Vale, uh, Freshways, and a couple of others. It was quite a quite a dynamic time uh, to be part of the company. Uh, subsequently to that, then I spent uh, over fifteen years with the Irish Farmers Association as their Environment and Infrastructure Executive. Um, a busy uh, uh, space, uh, advocacy, working hard and diligently, you know, for for farmers. Uh, across the environmental and infrastructure agenda. During that time, I was lucky enough to be able to partner with the Environmental Protection Agency with the establishment of the Smart Farming Programme um, and uh, also be involved in many wor other worthwhile initiatives uh, uh, for farmers. My, my current role yeah, um, is I'm the Senior Sustainability Manager with Glanbia. Um, it's a really exciting uh, space to be in right now. Uh, a lot of big questions being asked uh, by customers, by consumers, um, and for a company like Glambia to be able to step out with our sustainability strategy and to be able to robustly respond to them, um, I'm delighted to be playing my part here in Glambia in that, in, in that respect, Andy. Thanks. Thanks for that, Thomas. So maybe you might share your, your presentation with us, um, and we'll, we'll drift back into the, into the background, and if you can share and begin your presentation, could I remind you as our, our audience, if you could, don't forget about the Q&A uh, session, section at the bottom of your screen and just uh, keep putting in some comments and questions there. Okay, over to you, Thomas. Okay, so look, thank you very much. So um, um, as I was saying, um, the opportunity, is, it's appreciated to talk about our sustainability strategy. And here in Glanby, Ireland, uh, our sustainability strategy is called Living Proof. Um, and when we talk about living proof, um, it's our commitment uh, to farming, food and the future. So when we were developing out our sustainability strategy here in Glanbia, it was very much looking right across our supply chain, not just what's happening on farm, but the food piece within our own business, um, um, within our own processing. And also as a cooperative, very much instilled and embedded within the local community, looking to the future and speaking to that. So it's so it's quite a wholesome and complete sustainability strategy. Um, this here, every, every good strategy has got a look at um, um, a launch photo, so to speak. And the only reason I'm putting this up is to remind ourselves that sometimes when it comes to sustainability, we often forget core strengths and advantages that are here in front of us. First of all, um, you'll see in the middle of the picture there, John Murphy, our chairman, to the fact that as a cooperative, uh, our sustainability strategy was approved and signed off by our board and is led very strongly by our chairman on behalf of the company. That's the, that's the buy-in we have within Glanbia for our sustainability strategy. Also, importantly, 
Uh, the Baron family here, three generations, which is typical of farming here in Ireland, the multi-generational uh, um, aspect of, of, of food production, dairy production, and then Aoife Murphy, who's our director of ingredients here, here within the business. But also looking around, this is it's not idyllic scenery, that natural hedgerows, the grassland, and what goes with it, but just to remind ourselves of typical food production uh, here in Ireland. In terms of why are we why have we stepped out with Living Proof, which is led, which is almost 12 months old, we, we launched it in, in, in July of last year. Well, look, we were stepping out with Living Proof for a number of reasons. One, in terms of highlighting what's required, because I don't know about you, Andy, but you know, suppliers know there's change afoot. They, they know there's change happening when it comes to sustainability. And what they're yearning for is a level of direction and certainty as regards what that change, what that future looks like. But also in terms of outlining much of what is happening on farm, because I'm reminded uh, by Sean Malloy, Jim Berrigan and others that when it comes to sustainability, it's not a new journey for us here in Glanbia Co-op. It's the rate and pace at which we take action is really what's at hand. And indeed, look, we're, we're brand owners and partners, some of the world's biggest brands, and therefore then we clearly have an obligation to look to step up and step in when it comes to this whole area in terms of helping future-proof our sector. And in terms of look, our journey and, and um, just some key call outs uh, around the journey we have been on. Well, look, we're, we're proud to have been founding members of, of Origin Green, um, Ireland, Pi Ireland's pioneering food and drink sustainability program. You know, pioneering the rollout and implementation of or be as independent third party certification, uh, ESTAS audits on farms at least every 18 months. When it comes to animal health and welfare, our 2020 beef club, where we've over 24 and a half thousand calves enrolled to the Copa Kojika award-winning 2020 Beef Club with an ambition of enrolling 50,000 animals per year. Indeed, <clears throat> we're joined on this call by Noel Meehan. And I think <clears throat> Jim Bergen in his capacity as chair of Dairy Industry Ireland in 2018, we're really proud of the leadership role Glanby Ireland has taken in terms of the development and establishment of the ASIP programme <clears throat> with the whole of government, the whole of sector collaborative approach taken to improving water quality, moving beyond the requirements of regulation and legislation. And indeed, you know, I can say by the end of next month, we will have five full-time water quality ASAP advisors in place, working hand in glove with our suppliers specifically on this issue. When it comes to bringing the latest research and science um, um, to our suppliers, our, our, our signpost future farm program, where we have 11 demonstration farms for knowledge transfer, on advancement in technology and farming practices for action on climate change. And then bringing all this to the marketplace uh, through our truly grass-fed uh, brand, which we launched in, in, the, in, in the US in 2018. It is worth just reminding ourselves that we are looking at and we're calculating on-farm carbon since 2014, both in Glanbia and nationally also, uh, with nationally over 250,000 carbon assessments now completed by Borbia uh, as part of the estas Esplas pro program. You know, I'm reminded that there are only 137,000 farm families. So many, many farmers are in, their, are in their second iteration of looking at, of monitoring, managing, and measuring carbon on farm. Indeed, we're, since, since 2020, we've been participating in an industry-led initiative called Project Clover in the whole area of anaerobic digestion, uh, with hopes uh, this, uh, towards the back end of this year, of government announcements around a renewable heat obligation. In terms of the current journey, journey we're on, you know, I could go on and, 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 and there's some other initiatives and programs listed there. But if we stop there, we're not meeting the challenges that are in front of us. And so in coming forward with living proof, the ambition statement around living proof is that by combining the strengths of our heritage, our farmers and our people, we are building on excellent foundations a rich ecosystem and natural supply credentials to embed our sustainability ethos as we responsibly enrich and deliver a healthy future for all our communities. So bolstering up that ambition statement is three very strong pillars. And in Living Proof, we've got three focus areas. The first one is on our family farms, where Living Proof is about our passionate commitment to tackling climate change through supporting our suppliers on their sustainability journey, Implementing what's known as regenerative agriculture practices through building soil health and championing biodiversity, safeguarding and protecting animal welfare or waterways and air quality. 
in terms of for you and and, and our planet uh, living proof that means demonstrating we care every day for the people and planet by offering consumers a choice of both plant and dairy based innovation. By promoting natural nutrition and sustainable diets and by providing healthy animal nutrition. Indeed, continuing to lower our own car or our own production emissions, uh, in addition to focusing working with our suppliers, championing the circular economy programs and collaborating with producers to source our ingredients responsibly. Not surprising as a co-op, the third pillar is in our communities and as communities at heart. And it's about staying true to our belief of the importance of our cooperative ethos. It's about demonstrating our commitment to diversity, inclusion and fairness amongst our employees, actively promoting the well-being of employees in the farming community and ensuring we play our part in, in ensuring that rural communities remain vibrant and sustainable. So these are the three pillars which are bolstering if you like that lofty ambition statement. But if we go right back to the first slide I presented, I said living proof is our commitment to farming food in the future. And where and, and, and commitment, you know, when, when these words were being chosen, they were carefully chosen because commitment means you have to come forward with, with, with time bound and measurable targets. And in that regard, here is the clear journey we're on as, as a co-op out to 20. 20, out to 2030 and ultimately out to 2050. Uh, the ambition on net zero by, 20, by, by no later than 2050. So under that first pillar on our family farms, um, as a co-op, we've signed up to what's called a science-based targets initiative, uh, aligning to the goals of the Paris Agreement and working with our suppliers to reduce by 30% the emissions associated with every litre of milk they produce by 2030. In the whole area of soil health, uh, uh, clearly calling out that all our suppliers will have new to manage plans in place by the end of 2025 in the, in the area of animal welfare. All our suppliers will be certified to the higher animal welfare standards called our Greener World Animal Welfare Proof Standards by the end of 2025. When it comes to water quality, uh, all our suppliers who are in priority areas for action will have water remediation plans in place and be delivered against by the end of 2025. And we're delighted to be able to say that we've delivered on uh, one of our first key objectives on the whole area of operation biodiversity, whereby when we stepped out with this program in December uh, 2020, we wanted within 24 months to be able to uh, support our suppliers to have 100,000 native trees and hedging planted by the end of, 20, of 2022. Such was the ambition that that, that that was actually delivered within a 12 month period. And indeed, we're currently working on the new objectives out to 2025 when it comes to biodiversity. So the second pillar for you and our planet, it's about achieving 100% of packaging for all consumer brands compatible with the circular economy, delivering 100% of our portfolio compliant with our nutritional standards by 2025, 100% of inputs for food to be sourced sustainably by 2030. In addition to signing up to the science-based targets initiative for on-farm, we're also aligning when it comes to what's called scope one and two, in, in terms of our own processing sites, uh, committing to a 30% reduction in absolute terms of 2030, maintaining zero waste to landfill and having food waste by 2030 also. Finally, that third pillar in our communities, uh, enriching all the communities we, we serve. Uh, and the objective there is around achieving 50-50 female male representation and leadership roles in Glan by 2030, and staying true to our cooperative ethos through continuous engagement and support sustainable supporting cultural and community projects for the benefit of all. So these are, these are the, the time bound measurable targets against which we're all striving to deliver uh, over the next number of years here, here in Glambia. And <clears throat> in terms of the work agenda, we're concentrating, myself and our colleagues here in Glambia Co-op are concentrating on the five core areas of carbon reduction, regenerative agriculture, natural nutrition, the circular economy and growing together when it comes to delivering our living proof sustainability strategy. And these five work areas are crystallized here within, within this slide here, with the first three on carbon reduction, speaking, speaking to the area of the sciences targets initiative and our 30% reduction in emissions in scope one and two, and also in scope three, the on farm piece. And then the regenerative agriculture in the whole area of soil health, water quality, uh, animal health and welfare and biodiversity, circular economy, looking at food waste, plastic usage, packaging, natural nutrition, looking at 
uh, and nutritional standards and responsibly sourcing food ingredients and then going together looking at our at, at our gender balance representation and supporting our communities. For any of you who are have an interest in the sustainable sustainability arena, the universal, if you like, international language of sustainability is the UN SDGs or the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And whilst living proof doesn't speak to every one of the 17 uh, uh, sustainable development goals, what I'm just calling out here is how many of the uh, uh, many of our actions, if you look at the five work areas, there are a summary of the five work areas along the left hand side, carbon reduction, regenerative agriculture and so forth, and how they're aligned with another uh, um, with a, a key number uh, of the 17 sustainable development goals. I think as a co-op, uh, which is very much driven and owned by, by our farmer suppliers, we're really strong in particular around goal number 17, that partnership piece. Because this is about a collaborative joint journey together, ensuring we get there together uh, um, um, uh, sustainably, economically um, and environmentally sustainably. So in terms of um, continuing our journey, uh, there's a focus on advocacy, there's a focus on partnership in terms of industry participation and also research, uh, because the truth of it is, there's a lot of the, the big questions from a research perspective still remain to be answered. Um, and so in terms of um, um, partnerships here, I'm just calling out some of the national and international partnerships we're involved in, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, the Dairy Sustainability Framework, Dairy Sustainability Ireland, Sci Platform, and the International Dairy Federation. In terms of research, uh, and in the interest of time, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll just focus in on our priority areas here. Uh, over the next number of years, we've got four core areas we're concentrating on. When it comes to carbon reduction, the whole area of carbon sequestration, and also carbon reduction from manufacturing. Regenerative agriculture, looking at means and aims around the whole area of methane and methane reduction. Uh, natural nutrition, a future-proof protein supply chain with a positive impact on the bioeconomy, environment, biodiversity, food, and nutrition security and consumer trust. The circular economy, minimizing food waste with a specific focus on packaging and the valorization of waste. Um, it's good to have that strategy in place. And to be fair to myself and a large number of colleagues internally within Glambia Co-op, you know, it was a milestone to be able to get that uh, sustainability strategy done and developed and almost 12 months old this month. However, a strategy is a strategy. What we've been doing since we've launched our sustainability strategy is looking at turning that, that sustainability strategy into action. So on the basis of our targets, how are we going to support our suppliers? How are we as a business going to focus in on delivering uh, um, some of these key targets? And the first thing I'm going to touch on here is our sustainability action payment. You know, it's, it's, it's great for us to be able to say um, that Glambia Co-op is the, the only co-op to pay for sustainability as part of milk price uh, currently. And in terms of talking about our sustainability action payment, we launched a voluntary sustainability action payment, which will result in our milk suppliers achieving a milk price payment for delivering sp specific sustainability actions. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. Each of our suppliers uh, receives a half a cent a litre to all suppliers for delivering undefined actions. And this represents a potential average payment of 3,000 euros to Glambia, to Glambia Ireland suppliers. Uh, annually, the sustainability action payment, there's a budget of 18 million euros for this sustainability action payment across our 4,500 suppliers. Under this initiative, 18 sustainability options are available from which suppliers are requested to achieve up to seven options that they will action on their individual farms and provide appropriate proof points of delivery. And the reason we're presenting a menu of 18 options is and, and asking suppliers to select seven is because we clearly understand the difference between farm type, the difference between soils and, 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 and other um, challenges, and the clarity that farmers know their own business best. If we can use the science and research to, to, to select 18 credible tangible measures that will make a difference and then leave the flexibility to our suppliers to pick and to make and to pick the, the options which, which are best suited to our farms uh, in order to make uh, that environmental difference. 
So on the basis that a supplier delivers on his or her individual selected options, they'll receive full sustainability payment to be paid in the, in, in the case of where they select seven or pro rata basis for partial delivery. So if they select five, they'll get a, a pro rata payment thereof. So the program began this year <clears throat> as part of a three-year initiative with a full review taking place in 2024. The success of the program will be monitored annually by our board with the appropriate updates as appropriate. In recognition of our suppliers' current on-farm sustainability actions, for this year, all suppliers are receiving the full payment unconditionally. Uh, this also allows each supplier time to plan for delivery of their actions uh, because the actions, they need to take actions this year in order to continue uh, to get their full half a centiliter next year. From year two, from next year, the sustainability payment will be based on the delivery of up to seven actions from the menu. Monthly payments will begin in January of next year, pending confirmation of delivery by proof points. Over the duration of the initiative, the menu of options can be extended to provide an increased range of choices for milk suppliers in terms of sustainability actions that can be selected. This piece here was important in that it's a three-year program. But within that three years, uh, as a co-op, we have to leave scope for innovation and research that's going to come through the system, whether that's in the area of methane inhibitors, whether it's soil carbon, um, and in the event of them coming through between now and 2024, the menu of options available to our suppliers will be adjusted accordingly to provide uh, the ability to take up these opportunities as they arise. So if you step into, if you like, the sustainability cafe for Atlantia co-op supplier, this is the 18 options that are available to our suppliers um, and of which they're asked to deliver on seven in order to continue to receive their sustainability action payment. So in the whole area of carbon reduction, the options are measuring grass growth, clover use, multi-species spores, milk recording, improving herd EBI and the use of low crude protein feed. In the area of improving air quality, it's the use of low emission slurry spreading equipment, the use of protected urea. Biodiversity, it's about additional native trees and native hedging. Soil health, it's about soil nutrient management planning. Water protection, it's about having an asset water quality uh, plan in place for identified, where the necessity is identified by, by law pro. Fence, uh, it's about fencing off water courses, reducing fossil fuels, it's about renewable energy use. And then the whole area of animal health and welfare, it's about herd disease screening, it's about participating in the 2020 Beef Club, it's about improved somatic cell counts, and it's about the use of sex semen. For any of you who've been on previous webinars, you'll recognize many of these measures as being directly linked and taken from the Chagas marginal abatement cost curve, or the Chagas climate plan, as I often refer to it. In what, what we've tried to do in selecting these 18 measures is allow the science inform the action. So clearly, the, the, the Chagas marginal abatement cost curve calls out specific actions, whether it's improving herd EBI, whether it's use of protected jury, or many of the others that are here, which, if delivered, if implemented, can significantly play a role in terms of improving um, um, our climate, our ammonia performance, but also there's, a, the, there's a, a symbiotic relationship between many of these areas and, for example, protecting water quality, uh, protecting air quality, biodiversity. So you get the, the win-wins across uh, um, a large number. And indeed, as suppliers say to me, many of these measures also make sense because they also improve economic performance on their farms also. Um, and so <clears throat> I think in the last slide or two, uh, I just want to draw attention maybe to two other areas that we're very much focused on. Um, and that's around working with our suppliers to build sustainability knowledge capacity. Um, I mean, for many of our suppliers, when they were doing the green cert, the focus was very much around productivity. It was around, it was around uh, yield, uh, both, and, and that's both milk and grass. And it acknowledged Going back to my, my, my point around suppliers and there's, and there's change afoot around this whole sustainability space, they'd acknowledge that, yes, there's change coming, give us the tools and support us uh, with the knowledge and information we require. And indeed, that's the valuable service this signpost webinar series does. In addition to that, as a company, we've also partnered with our key dairy ingredients customer, uh, Bailey's, to, to Bring to, to bring to our suppliers what we call a sustainable farming academy. And in the sustainable farming academy, each year 
we have 20 part-time fully funded diploma level seven diplomas available for our suppliers in environment sustainability and climate uh, which which is ran by by ucc uh, and we're commencing with our first cohort um, of our diploma um, um, undergraduates in september of this year and to give you a sense of the level of interest in this program and we just stepped out of it this year there was four times more uh, um, um, entries or applicants for the program than there are places so as as if you like a sustainability practitioner within glanbia but also within the agri-food sector i'm emboldened by the level of interest and by the level of desire to, to get involved in the sustainability agenda as shown by Glambia Co-op suppliers, whether that's, whether that's wanting to participate in diploma, whether that's participating in Operation Biodiversity or engagement in the ASSET program. The second element of our Sustainability Farming Academy is a bursary we have available uh, to family members of Glambia Co-op suppliers who are commencing their studies to degree level in agricultural science in either UCD, UCC or the Southeast Technology University. That's currently open uh, until, uh, on, on, until early August. So any family member who might be commencing their degree studies um, uh, in agricultural science in, in any of them institutes uh, should contact us if they're interested in getting a thousand euro bursary. Importantly, um, we're partners once again with Chagas regarding the signpost uh, future farm program. This is a really important program for us in terms of taking that science and research that's coming out of Moor Park, Johnstone Castle, and many other uh, um, 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 institutes, uh, and really uh, having a really positive impact and engagement with our suppliers to turn that into uh, practical on-farm action. So as part of the Signpost Living Proof Future Farm Programme, it's running from 2021 to 2025. There's a full range of objectives running across biodiversity, running across air quality, water, but I've called out three here. The first one is around reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40% and ammonia emissions by 20%, increasing nitrogen use efficiency uh, to 35%, and importantly, improving net profit on farm also. Uh, there's an old adage that's often said, it's hard to be green when you're in the red. It's important we, we realize and we understand that um, um, financial uh, and economic performance is a key driver of improving environmental performance also. Each of our suppliers that are participating in the Future Farm Programme will have a farm sustainability plan prepared annually, and their progress will be benchmarked against their starting point, against other signpost farmers, and targets for the farm will be set, and it's, and it's available at the end of each year and updated at the end of each year. Importantly, our participants are also members of the soil, uh, in, 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 and, and think back around my slide on research, one of the key focus areas was soil carbon sequestration. And in that context, our, participant, our, our participants in this program are members of the NASCO or the National Agricultural Soil Carbon Observatory, where each of the farms are participating uh, have deep soil samples taken, LIDAR above ground carbon uh, analysis of above ground carbon stocks are conducted, sampling will be repeated at the end of the program to monitor changes in soil carbon. Uh, in addition, a number of our suppliers have the carbon flux towers installed to monitor atmospheric uh, uh, carbon. When it comes to whole area biodiversity and water quality, biodiversity baseline assessments for each farm with actions tailored for each farm is included in the, in the farm sustainability plan. Uh, water quality risk-based assessments are carried out on farm and remediation plans are prepared by our, um, our ASAP uh, farm sustainability development of, uh, advisors. And so look, my final slide here is just really calling out last month's farm focus. This is an internal newsletter. Um, uh, that we would have for our suppliers, which isn't exclusively dedicated to sustainability. As you can imagine, it has everything in it around mid quality, around programs and schemes. But I just took as an example, and I, I, I just took this in preparing for, for this, within that newsletter, there's a, at least seven pages dedicated to the area of sustainability. Uh, detail around the sustainability action payment, one of, our, one of our future farm participants, Donald Kavanagh, there talking about his journey and the key actions he's taking to improve sustainability on his farm. A little bit there around Sustainable Farming Academy, a piece around pollinators. Shane O'Loughlin from Honest Revan talking to us around uh, uh, his sustainability journey. TJ Phelan there, one of our, our ASAP sustainability advisors, talking about nitrogen. 
and the importance of improved efficiency and how and how that can reduce emissions in terms of tailoring nitrogen use. So, so look, Andy, that's very much uh, my run through, and I really appreciate the opportunity to run through our living proof sustainability strategy. But more importantly, how we're turning that strategy into action in terms of supporting our suppliers uh, and working right across the company to bring them targets and time bound targets to life. So look, maybe I'll, I'll stop presenting at that if that's OK. Lovely, Thomas, thanks very much for that. I mean, we often speak and mention, say the word sustain, sustainable or sustainability. And, you know, we, we've seen it in a lot of the presentations that we, we, we've gone through on, on this series, the depth and the amount of work and the width of the, the, this subject is incredible. Um, you know, we, 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 we use this term from farm to fork, um, but the amount of, uh, you know, work that has to go in uh, to prove our sustainability. And at the end of the day, Thomas, I presume, you know, your, your markets are, are looking for this stuff, you know, um, they want it and they, they just don't really want you to know you tell them you're doing it. They want the proof that you are doing it as well. And, and it, I'm sure it's, it's hugely important for your markets and demanded by your markets. Yeah, it is. It is, Andy. I mean, we all know, uh, and many of you, many of those watching in will be aware, when it comes to, if you like, carbon footprint, you know, Ireland has a good story to tell in terms of being having the lowest carbon footprint uh, uh, in dairy in terms of emissions per kilo uh, of product um, and in the top five when it comes to beef. Our customers understand that. And even though, if you like, we're in the premiership position, our customers on behalf of consumers are, are saying that's good, but we still need to see a trajectory of improvement. Um, the mindset of, of some customers when it comes to sustainability is very much looking at it in the same way as they look at milk quality, as they look at health and safety. It's a requirement to maintain and to stay doing business. Um, because that's look when we look at the, the Friday for Future marches, when we look at the consumer generation Z, when we look at, you know, they're, they're calling out sustainability as a, as, as a key area that they're very much focused on. And these are our customers and consumers of today and tomorrow. And the retailers and customers to, to, to Landia Co-op are calling this out on, on their behalf as a requirement of doing business. We have a huge number of questions coming in, Thomas, okay. and a lot of very positive comments for the the depth of your presentation and the quality of your presentation. Um, you. But one thing I, that we just, we, we're going to have to pull some of these questions together, Noel. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> to, at that, yeah. To, to get through them all. But I mean, research constantly seems to be coming through, uh, Thomas, in your presentation, whether it's agricultural research, I mean, there's research, obviously a huge amount of research going on within your own organization. You're very adapted at research. But I mean, I presume that's really, you need that. And that's what's driving even a lot of your actions as well. You, you mentioned it as well in your, in your presentation and how the importance of research. Um, so, so, so maybe two points on that. First of all, yes. However, um, in the first instance, we need to support our suppliers for mass uptake of existing actions. So before we get lost in a big discussion around research, and I'll come back to it, we know the right thing to do is to milk record, is to have a nutrient management plan in place, is to be using protected urea, is to be spreading slurry using low emission slurry spreading, and many of the measures we have within our sustainability action payment, right? What, what as, a, as, as a co op, we're doing, we're focusing in on today the actions that are in front of us that can make the most positive environmental actions and rewarding, incentivizing suppliers for delivery against them. So rather than getting lost in a big discussion around research, we have to ask ourselves and challenge ourselves, are we using our best endeavors? Are we doing all we can based on the existing actions and measures that are there? However, to your point, in my view, we're in, we're in for a research race of a decade uh, in the sense that <clears throat> look at the challenges that are currently taking place regarding you know, the, 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 the sectoral targets, you know, what they'll be or where they'll land and concerns if they go above a certain level, the implications they might mean. Unless research comes forward with solutions, we're going to be in a very difficult position here as a country. Whether that's feed additives, um, um, whether that's carbon sequestration and storage, whether that's carbon farming, right now, suppliers will rightly call out, it's simply the methane and nitrous oxide that's being looked at and being considered 
when it comes to taking a view uh, of what's happening on farm. We need the robustness and the governance around the measurement and monitoring of the carbon that's stored and sequestered in their soils so as we make sure we get a full and fairer picture of what's happening. And on the basis of that, the research community and the research work coming through is going to be really important. And you'll see within our sustainability action payment, we've left flexibility because we see the importance of that coming through. We've left flexibility to adjust uh, and amend our sustainability action payment uh, to make room for that, Andy. Thomas, thanks. Uh, Noel, will you we'll have a, a try at some of those list of questions? We're not going to get through them all, but we'll do our no. best. We, we won't get through them all, there's, a, there's, an, there's an awful lot, but what I'll do is, is, is <coughs> get to try and, and group some. So one of the things that came back very, a lot of questions about Thomas was um, your, the, the, regenerative, the regenerative agriculture that you're, you're undertaking there. So I'll just group a little bit of them together. So what does it entail for the farmer? Um, how are you measuring it? Um, how is it going to reduce methane? Um, and ultimately, importantly, how are you going to communicate uh, the, the, the results of this initiative uh, to consumers and to the public? So a lot in that one for you, Thomas. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. Um, 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 let me see if we can try and if we can try and, and answer them. So, so, so for us, <coughs> for us, Noel, um, <coughs> when it comes to regenerative agriculture, um, your listeners shouldn't be spooked by the terms because immediately when people hear regenerative agriculture, they almost fall back to saying, look, is he talking about organics? You know, we're not. So much of regenerative agriculture is about soil health. It's about biodiversity. It's about water quality. It's about animal health. And this is, uh, and, and welfare. And this is very much, as a, as, as a co-op, we have themed them four core areas as being what regenerative agriculture means to Glanbia Co-op. Um, and, and very much when we define that and we talk to our, talk to our customers um, around regenerative agriculture and supporting soil health, um, that resonates with them. They understand it um, and, and, and they like it. And I think if we're to be honest and we see where farm to fork is going, where Green Deal is going, where acclimatizing and all these other, and even, even um, 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 food vision, we see the challenges that are going to come around chemical nitrogen use and availability. So all of a sudden, we almost have to go back to come forward. And bear with me on this, Noel. I have to go back now to my grandfather's generation to begin to have the discussion around why was it that their generation was spreading more lime than we were up to this year? Why was it, and, and, and how is it their soil health was better than perhaps ours is now? And in many ways, the, 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 the surety that perhaps suppliers would have had that came from the availability of chemical nitrogen up to now can no longer be assumed. If we're going to keep growing our cheapest form of feed, that lush green grass, we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to get our soil health, uh, uh, address soil health challenges, improve pH, uh, improve indices in soils, and I think we're really in for a really um, um, exciting regenerative agriculture discussion over the next number of years as we match pace with, as policy seeks to pull a handbrake maybe on, on chemical nitrogen use and how we improve soil health to address that so as, we're, so, as we're going to, so as we're growing the cheapest form of feed better every day, that, that lush green grass. So it's the balance of the necessity driving performance, but also the opportunity as well. Very good. Um, no, look, it's, it's, a, it's a massive area and, uh, and there's going to be a lot of development on that going forward. So we'd be interested to see how, how that progresses. Um, I suppose just you kind of touched on a few things there uh, that kind of were, were questions here as well. So, you know, I suppose there's a couple of questions in around, um, I suppose you were very much farmer focused on what you, you, you had in today, but I suppose there's questions around Glambia Inc. and we'll say um, energy use and net zero ambition uh, for carbon. So is there, is, are you making any moves from, I suppose, the processing side and, and that uh, around um, your energy use there? Yeah, very much. And, and, and I think in presenting today, maybe I was, I was just conscious of the, maybe the audience. So, so if, we, if we play back to maybe the early part of the slides, within Zambia Co-op, we have a commitment within our processing to reduce by abs in, in absolute terms emissions associated with our processing by 30% by 2030. In order to be able to achieve that, um, um, the role of biomethane is going to be extremely important. Uh, and this is where calling out in a very honest way, we would be 
somewhat frustrated at the failure to come forward, or failure of government to come forward, maybe with a strong, robust renewable heat obligation scheme. Um, you know, this is something there is across uh, across the sector. There's a high level of collaboration through what's called Project Clover, uh, whereby ourselves and a large number of the other co-ops have come together, pooling, you know, the desire to want, you know, to displace fossil fuel use, you know, within processing, replace it with biomethane. Uh, uh, and I think in 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 that context, uh, no different than you know when when wind or solar or other renewables uh, developed, there is need for state uh, intervention when it comes to uh, meeting the, the 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 capital costs, particularly around the development um, of a vibrant biomethane um, uh, a, vib a vibrant biomethane piece. But look, very much focused on it. Yeah. It's there. It's within our business, and we're being held accountable for you know internally for for delivery against that because the living proof sustainability strategy it straddles right across our farms right across our processing and also indeed indeed within the communities also and as you'd expect as a core just on that thomas no sorry for interjecting no, work right. there's a you know the one or two questions there the comments or questions really around you know your your fleet of vehicles have you any plans or you just mentioned biomethane you know is there any plans for like hydrogen or uh, or a conversion of some of your your vehicles or your yeah we yeah we have a number in trial at the moment Andy okay or yeah 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 we have a number in trial at the moment uh, and 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 it's it's it's, it's more biomethane I think um, hydrogen is still really in the early stages of development even though the state is currently you know beginning to progress legislation through through it all and I think they're going to pick it up after after the summer the summer recess again uh, but very much in the um, um, piloting the use uh, particularly on biomethane. More so, more so than hydrogen, Andy. So again, yeah. it's part of the exciting innovation that is within this sustainability space. Yeah, I think hydrogen probably will have a role in more heavy vehicles. Correct, uh, and that's yeah. possibly where the, the question is coming from. Sorry, no, no, you're you're grand, you're grand, uh, Andy. Um, I suppose there was just a couple of questions there. Like you're very ambitious with uh, with what you're uh, asking farmers to do, and. Uh, you've you've alluded to, it, but maybe you can expand a little bit further on on how Glambia is is working to support the farmer farming community. And you mentioned your your sustainability advisor, so um, maybe if you just elaborate a little bit on that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Noel. Okay, so so first of all, um, regardless, maybe so we have uh, great experts in terms of our sustainability advisors, but before that, just to say to you, when it comes to sustainability. Within Glanbia Co-op, we see it as everyone's responsibility because um, it's whilst whilst a number of us, if you like, are, are, are leading out look within the business, the truth of it is it's now mainstreamed as part of our way of working around living proof, around sustainability, in terms of thinking through the business decisions that are made, thinking through our actions and our engagements uh, with customers, with suppliers, um, um, etc. In terms of directly, if you like, working hand in glove with our suppliers. Um, and particularly if we focus in, for example, on the whole area of water quality. So um, we've got, uh, so by the end, or sorry, by, by early August, we're going to have increased our number of asset sustainability advisors to five. Okay, we have, um, we currently have three full-time colleagues and we have two others who have accepted the roles and, and will be starting with us uh, in early August. Um, each of them, ASAP sustainability advisors, are out working with our suppliers in what's called these priority areas for action, PAAs as we know them. Uh, effectively, these are water quality hotspots identified by the Environmental Protection Agency mapping and identified by LawPro as being either areas of early indication of water quality challenges or actual water quality challenges. So our, our ASAP water quality adv uh, sustainability advisors are working directly with our suppliers in these areas to put in place water quality remediation plans to address them challenges. In addition to that, we're moving outside of these priority areas for action, and we're looking at these end referral areas, whereby, <laughs> whereby there's, um, they're not specifically within the priority areas for action, but there's also perhaps a reason to be concerned, or there's early markers also that we need to mark and we need to look at, uh, and we need to look at improving. I think what's really wonderful is the positive engagement our suppliers, our, 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 asset, our asset advisors are having with our suppliers. In almost all situations, they're welcomed onto the farm, 
even though this is additional and supplemental to what's required under any regulation or legislation, the support and the guidance that's provided by the massive advisors um, um, is very much wanted and wanted and required um, by our suppliers. And I should call out, it's a really positive collaboration with yourselves and Chagas, with the local authorities through, through, through the Law Pro Office, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government. I think it's demonstration of, you know, when you work together, and you put a structure in place and you get a clear objective, you know, how you can tangibly begin to affect change positively. Yeah, and I suppose just, just on that, there's a couple of questions in around obviously the, the derogation and, and, the, and the, the 250 uh, stocking rate and so on. And, you know, I suppose um, it's, there is, there is uh, nitrogen pressures in the area that the Glambia are working in. Um, and I suppose, you know, the ASAP, ASAP uh, advisors are, are doing their bit there as well. But is there anything further that you could see from, you know, your, your sustainability bonus point of view that, that could work to help, um, I suppose, reduce the pressure from, the, from nitrogen on, on derogation farms to, the, to, to, the, to water quality? Yeah, I think um, 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 I think I think the, the the sector, to be honest, felt blindsided by this proposed move from the two hundred and fifty to two hundred and twenty. If I'm very honest, it came in it came in at at a very late stage, and the question we now have to think about here is: at what stage do we give regulations? Do we give uh, measures the opportunity to work their way through the system? Okay, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, look at. Look at, for example, the, the changes in the excretion rates. <clears throat> Very significant move uh, aligned to output and productivity in itself will have a significant impact <clears throat> in terms of uh, action and activity on farm. <clears throat> and then for the potential 250 to 20 then to be layered on top of it, um, you know, we're, we're at this stage to Dairy Sustainability Ireland, you know, we've requested clarity uh, from government from EPA, from Chagas, regarding what that looks like physically on the ground. So to understand if it were to be implemented, would it be implemented at county, at catchment, at sub-catchment level, at PAA level? Uh, if it were to be implemented, <clears throat> is it implemented for a 12-month period? Um, and then where, mark, where water quality markers improve, um, it's, it's amended again. Right now, there's a high level of, of or th th there's a need for state clarity around how such a measure might be implemented, because <clears throat> we don't just require it in Plan B, but our suppliers require it also. Because to be fair to them, they're trying to manage their business. They've got their loans, they've got their borrowings for the next, and, 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 and they have to meet their expectations uh, over the next number of years. So right now I would say, no, there's a requirement in the state to come forward with necessary clarity. So our suppliers begin to understand <laughs> what, what the impacts of this fully looks like. But we also, have to, we also have to stand back and say, at what point do we also give these new measures the opportunity to actually make their way through and to work? Uh, whether, it's, you know, whether it's ourselves, I mean, as I say, when we were designing out the sustainability action payment, we looked almost exclusively at the Chagas marginal abatement cost curve, the measures contained in it, and we said, let's take the science, let's take the research, and let that specifically inform the action, in the belief that by doing so, we will improve water quality, we will lower ammonia emissions, we will lower greenhouse gas emissions, we will improve biodiversity and deliver on the overall objectives, not just of living proof, but also make that contribution towards the requirements of, of, of for Ireland Inc. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Thomas, maybe just, to, there's a few very specific questions, um, that maybe quick fire we could call them. I mean, is, do you have any um, specific targets for, you, you have your targets for um, carbon footprint? Is there any specific target for total emissions or absolute emissions? Now, obviously, if you reduce your carbon footprint, you in turn could reduce your um, your total emissions. But are you looking at total emissions uh, in any of your projects, or what's your thoughts on on that? Okay. Okay. Very good. So, so in terms of the the approach you're taking, it's a thirty percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions off our 2018 base year, right? Okay. So, so every, every one of our suppliers um, would have their, if you like, a carbon number that they would have received from um, Borbia as part of Restas. Indeed, as a company, then we would have our own carbon number. So, so, so the journey we're on here is to reduce by 30% the emissions associated with that carbon number um, 
by 2030. In terms of within our own within our own processing piece, I think the, the question was asked by by uh, um, um, Noel on behalf of um, a viewer. Um, it's a 30% reduction in absolute. Okay, so 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 um, net 30% uh, reduction. So that's the journey we're on here here within Glambia, Andy. Okay. Um, the other so one a comment, made a comment in the question, you know, that food is quite price sensitive in terms of price. You know, we're going through a relative boom in the price of commodities at the moment. But, you know, how would we react or if suddenly the, the price of, of food, God forbid, or, or milk um, started to fall? I mean, um, that is a, you know, a, a, if you like a contingency that has to be built into the system, I presume as well. Um, look, look. Of course, um, and indeed, whether it's um, stepping forward with, with with schemes over the years, Glambia hasn't been found wanting in terms of schemes and programs um, when such difficult periods arise. However, when it comes to sustainability, I'd like to be able to say that this journey is optional. Would I be misleading everyone on this call? Um, the the sustainability action payments you can clearly see, for example. For ourselves it's part of a three-year program so it's concreted in place for 2022 to 2024 regardless of the wider if you like um, um, environment the wider economic environment sustainability is a requirement now in the marketplace so so it's not something that you know we we as as a company or our suppliers or our customers have the option of when mm -hmm. markets are strong it's a it's a joint journey we're on as part of um, um, a, a requirement in the marketplace. And indeed, I think if we align that journey with economic and environmental sustainability, going back to the sustainable development goals and goal number 17 on partnership for the delivery of the sustainable development goals, where we're aligning that piece around economic um, and environmental sustainability, I believe we'll actually get there together. Um, 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 and so, so that's the hope. Yeah, Thomas is interesting. We had one or two comments come in there that that farmers are up to the up to the task, and right. not to, you know that they say that they're not going to be found wanting, which is is hugely positive to see. And, and a couple of more comments uh, going back to your previous life with the IFA, com commenting that you you're carrying on the good work of smart farming. So it's a mm -hmm. it's a journey really that everybody and every organisation I think we, we we have to be on. the 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 term net zero, and it's been mentioned a few times. Uh, even in questions there and you know you mentioned it with water quality should we have a region or should we have a an area of, of, of with different targets i mean within farms there are some farms that will say we are at net zero um mm. and we had it even going back to the reps um scheme that farmers that are in reps could we get more for selling products from reps farms or for do you think or is is there any um merit in trying to sell like a, a net zero milk or a premium Milk zero. Do you think it would command a, an extra price? No. Could it be sold? As it could all the farmers get to it, or could it be sold from a specific group? Uh, you know, like maybe the way to organic milk. Yeah. yeah. And 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 I think Andy, if we play back the research question, the first thing we have to be able to do, say with a high level of certainty, exactly where we're at, right? Because wouldn't it be wonderful if over the next number of years the research actually told us that net zero is a niche, but it's mainstream to Irish agriculture. That if the research told us, when you look at your hedgerows, when you, when you include your hedgerows, when you look at what's happening with your soil carbon, when you look at the work coming through these flux towers that are being put in place uh, that I spoke about earlier, and you sum up these three parts, and then you look at, if you like, what's happening with methane and nitrous oxide. My question back to the research community is, when the sum of the parts are pulled together, should net zero be the preserve of the few, or, or is the potential that for Glambia co-op suppliers in the Southeast and for Ireland Inc, that there's a real opportunity for net zero as being representative of Ireland. Yes. Um, and that's something that's, I, I go back, I, you know, we are within this research race of, of a decade. You know, the, 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 the practitioners, the sustainability practitioners, the farmers, you know, all of us right, acting right within across the supply chain um, are all have, have an urgent requirement for this research to come through the system and to make its way through, you know, whether that's concluding out, for example, the work on the multi species, you know, and getting getting the firm pieces around uh, and finishing off on that. I think there's one thing we're sure of here is 
the role of research community has never been greater than it is right now, and that the focus needs to be on both the economic and the environmental sustainability piece. Noel, we're, we're nearing the end. We're up against the clock. Have there any more pressing questions you want to pull out there, or is there any? Yeah, look, I suppose about? it's just a, maybe a comment from Thomas. Um, the poster just put up a, a, a number of, of, of trends, and the trends are, are unfortunately in, in, the, in the negative direction. Um, and I suppose the point being that, you know, despite a lot of good work and, and a lot of good um, initiatives, uh, we do need to see the trend reversing. And I suppose maybe just a comment from yourself, Thomas, on that. Yeah, and, and the approach I've always taken is the science is the science. We're the practitioners who have an opportunity to make a difference. So the question for everyone looking in and all of us uh, and myself and Andy and Noel, are we using our best endeavours to get there? And I hope that those watching would acknowledge that for our part, within Glambia Co-op, we're serious about addressing these sustainability challenges. We have, uh, uh, we have a number of colleagues who are working exclusively on this whole area through the ASAP program. In addition to that, sustainability is mainstreamed right across our, our business. But going back to Andy's piece, genuinely everyone, I, I mean, the sense I get, I, I don't get a high level of resistance at all amongst the farming community to stepping up and stepping in I think what they're looking for is certainty around what that looks like. Um, because remember, 15 years ago, it was all about productivity. It was about taking out the ditch. It was about growing more grass. <clears throat> now they're being told they're all sins. <clears throat> and we're going through this transition period. And we need to be aware of that. And so much of what we're at here is a change management. And it's working with those that are um, um, at the cold face that put on the wellies every day to go out and make the difference that we're doing it together. Um, I, I you know the science is a science, but we, we all have to make sure we're using our best endeavours to turn that tide. And I'm convinced here in Glambia Co-op, but also our suppliers and the wider farming community were up for it. Yeah, thanks very much, Thomas. Um, and even sometimes a little bit of recognition for what is done positively within the farming community is often, uh, is, what, is what's needed. And, and frankly, often what's not given. Um, but Thomas, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. The best of luck with your strategy. Um, you're at the beginning of it. Um, thank you everybody for tuning in and listening to us. And thank you to all our listeners and viewers who've been so loyal for the last number of years now for tuning in every Friday morning. Uh, next week, we have Katrina Douglas. She's an ecologist with the uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service. And she's, we have a bit of a series now coming up for the next three or four weeks and even into August where we're going to be looking at the Irish uplands and their role and their function in biodiversity and indeed in, in people who live uh, within the uplands. So she's looking at the ecological value and the condition uh, of Irish uplands. So until next week, uh, thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you to Yvonne Maher in the background for all the help uh, and look forward to seeing you again uh, next week and have a nice weekend and enjoy the good weather. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Noel, for taking the time to put all those questions together. No problem. Thank you all very much.